Okay, I have no nickname. <clears throat> I don't think so. People call me, you call me nicknames, but I have no nickname. My name is Peter Mary Banks. In my family, I don't know if there was any other name called Peter. That was amazing that in my family, nor, did, nor normally in Ireland, you do have somebody called after you, you call, you're called after somebody else. My name was called, and I've, I've often wondered why my mother should ever call me Peter. Mary, I was born in December, and December is the month of Mary, which was a very important month, which I, which I said in church yesterday, I denied there was a call Mary, because in high school they would say, if you were called, what's your name? I said, always, my name is Peter. You, you've got to have a second name, and I would say, well, no, I think, you know, that's my name. Because if I said I was Peter Mary Banks, they would say a little bit, being called a girl's name. And, and now I'm very proud to be called Peter Mary Banks. Because I have great devotion to Our Lady, the Mother of Jesus. I think, she, the, as I said, the greatest woman that ever lived is Mary, the Mother of Jesus. The greatest woman that ever lived. So I'm very proud that my mother would honor me by calling me Peter Mary. I, I always say, who's the greatest man that ever lived? The children. And the children, I always say, the greatest man that ever lived was Jesus. For me, that's my life. It's, it's Jesus. He was the greatest man that ever lived. And he was also God, but he was the greatest man that ever lived. And the greatest man, the greatest woman that ever lived is the mother of the greatest man. Not recognized very often, but recognized by the, certainly by the Latino people. Go out and see our mural. Just take pictures of our mural and see what her devotion to our, our, our Lady Guadalupe. She appeared to, uh, to Juan Diego and, uh, in, in um, 1531, and she said, Don't forget, Juan Diego, do not be afraid, I am your mother. Which is a, an amazing saying to say, I am your mother. Even yes. when Jesus was dying, he said to John, John, this is your mother. And he said to his, to his mother, Mother, this is your son. So she repeated the same thing to Juan Diego, I am your mother. Beautiful, I mean, it's beautiful. So you were born in Ireland. Yes. Where in Ireland and in what year? The West Coast. Near Cork? Yes, Cork. Cork? Forget, about, forget about Cork. I was north, north of Cork. I'm in a place called Sligo, close to Galway, up to Donegal. I was born in uh, December 1st, 1945. So Ireland, how long were you there before you came to this country? I was there for 27 years. And why did you come to the United States? Because I was picked. I was supposed to go to Africa. When we were ordained priests, we were ordained, and then the superiors, our superiors, looked for the, for the needs of priests in various areas. And they looked, and I was supposed to go to Africa. And some priest who was here basically left, and so they had no priest to come to Watts. And I didn't know what the Watts existed. I knew Los Angeles existed, and so they picked me because it was newly ordained to go to Los Angeles. And you were uh, how old? When Twenty-seven. You... Twenty-seven. So, what was your first impressions of Los Angeles in comparison to where you had been before? Shock. And I've said this in in in, in, in newspaper articles. I was shocked because I first of all I didn't know it was black. I always thought of Los Angeles as being Hollywood, Disneyland, beach. And here I am, recrossing Century and Vermont, realizing this is a whole different world. Not, I'm not, I'm not depressed by it, but I'm just saying I was not prepared for it. Right. Nobody, the ever, nobody ever told me, this is, what, this is what you're going to enter. This is what you're going to expect. And the representations of Los Angeles are so one-dimensional. Oh, in, in Ireland, for us, it was Marilyn Monroe, it was all the other... The, the movie stars, that was, that was Los Angeles. Somebody priest said to me when I was going to Los Angeles, he said, oh, he said, you're falling on your feet. Meaning that I was, I was, I was. You I, made it. Every, I made it. Everything was wonderful. Different from what I thought of my, my, my own village. I mean, that's, that's it. What was your village like? Small village. When I was born, about 1,100 people. And then lived out, in fact, I lived outside the village. I didn't actually born in the village. I lived outside the village. Very simple, humble, poor, uh, honest people, uh, hardworking people, farmers, and uh, that was basically it. So your parents were farm. Your father was a farmer. My father was a farmer. <coughs> what did he farm? Vegetables, uh, cows, peas, potatoes, uh, turf. What we call turf. Now that's a bit different in in in, in that on here. When we say it's my turf, we mean it's territory. In one way, it is turkey because our turf came from the earth, and that was kept what kept our house warm. And so there was turf, potatoes, milk, vegetables, which kept us going. And my father also hired himself out because he had a little tractor, what they call tractor, and he hired himself out to work for others. 
Well, we were well, we were we were not well off because I'm I'm a family of thirteen. I've got ten, ten brothers, no nine brothers and three sisters, two daddy's babies. So we certainly were not well off, but we had enough. We survived. You survived. You lived. You didn't look. You had, didn't. I certainly didn't have anything over and above. Okay, so to what you you know fast forward, you arrive in Watts. Do you recall the date that you arrived here? I arrived around the uh, the at the end of November, in nineteen seventy three. Who was a woman who was um, hurt by the LA, well, killed by the LAPD in a domestic dispute over a gas bill? So because when I arrived, when I arrived, the sixty-five ri riots were fresh in the minds of the people. Still in seventy-three. Oh, so absolutely. There was nothing around here. The Martin Luther King Shopping Center was not there. The uh, bank was not there. The none of those buildings. The buildings in front of the church. There was nothing there. There was empty, empty lots. The back of the church. All that, uh, all that uh, place was not there. Across from us, so the church sat basically on an island. I, I, and when I came in, I said, "Where, where is the, where is the parish?" Because it still suffered from the seventy, uh, sixty-five riots. So there was nothing there. There was, there was nothing there. Where were the stores to buy food? I don't know where they were. I, when I came in, I was one. That's what I was wondering. Where, where are the stores? Where is anything? It was. They went out, obviously, probably South Gate, went out to Huntington Park. Um, over maybe by Martin Luther King Hospital, wherever they were, but it certainly was not here. So you've seen the building of a lot of infrastructure. Absolutely, since I mean, you've been it, here. Oh, that's when it began. It began around the. I came seventy three. I don't know when the uh, the Watts Shopping Centre came in Martin Luther King Junior Shopping Centre, but it was I think it was the late seventies. So also the bank, also the Janice Hall building, also the buildings in front of us. I think they were brought in from the airport because Ted Watkins was very powerful and he brought, those buildings were brought in here. The buildings up behind us, up here on the, on the on Third Street, all of those were brought in. So I've seen all of that. So you've given me a physical sense, but what were the people feeling that you encountered? That time, <clears throat> there was still a desolate feeling. There was still people feeling, black people feeling that we're abandoned. That's the way I felt. I felt a sense of abandonment. Because you looked at the place and said, well, did everybody walk out of here? They said, the ghost town, where's everybody? So I did feel that there was that, that feeling. And they were abandoned. They were abandoned. And I said, it was a bit of a sense of abandonment. No, but anybody who th thinks of Watts today, even thinks of Watts, outside Watts, thinks of Watts as black, violent, poor. And what, if that's you were it, gonna... That's because I know that exists in the white communities. And, and, and sometimes in the black community, outside Watts, they don't think of Watts as being Hispanic or Latino. They don't think of it. They just think of it as being black, poor, and violent. Crimes, gangs, and that's it. When did you see the kind of demographics change? Was it, were there Latinos here before when you came There in? were, but they were all Latinos. And the, the old Latinos didn't see themselves as Latinos. They, 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 I felt they always felt that it was, they were Americans. And what happened was, it, the, the, oh, the big change came in 70, about 77, 78, 79. It was obvious, an incredible influx of Latinos. And what do you attribute that to? Poverty in Mexico, probably. They go crossing the border, were looking for, they were just looking to survive. I think that's basically survival. And they came across, and that was it, and they were coming in, and, and they were able to buy the houses, and they, because they were able to buy the houses because four or five families would get together and buy a house, and the blacks were moving out. Uh, would you say that the Latinos who moved in were all from Mexico, or would you say Central American? Not, not in Watts. Vast majority, 85% of our parish is, Latin, is Mexico. I, I can ask them on a Sunday morning, just on all our services, we have five services in Spanish, I can ask them, how many of you are from Mexico? Mexico, for instance, beat Amer America yesterday, United States in soccer. Exactly. So I would say, how many of you were? They were all from Mexico. A few, maybe El Salvador, Guatemala, but that's about it. That's about it. It's not like the other part of Los Angeles. What's basically, at least in our church, is Mexico. Who else makes up your congregation? I know that we have African Americans in your congregation. Yes, we do. We have African. That's it. African Americans and Latinos. There are no whites, obviously. I had, a, I had a going away mass yesterday, it's a farewell mass, or thank you mass, and there were whites, but they came from Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, Westchester, 
uh, in St. Inez Valley, and they were amazed at but that, but they were, we joked about it, where did all the fights come from? And they came because they were friends of mine, and they came to Watts, and they've been helping me in Watts for years. So it's, it's uh, but that's what it is, it's Latinos and Blacks, or African Americans, I know which people refer to them as. Yeah, exactly, depends on what depends I just, who you talk to, exactly, you talk to. self-description. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about the issue of no whites in the church as well, or Asians. Is there a no, no Asians? Okay, but then we know we have Korean Americans in South LA for a while in you know the late eighties, right? Is that incorrect? Yes, yes. But actually, in in the early parts of Watts, before the rise, there there were Asians right here in the center of Watts. I, from what I heard, there was loads of Asians. And where were they from? Do you know? Korea. Korea. Korea was a lot of ones. They had shops, various things. Um, and so did you have any Korean American or Koreans in your congregation? Not that I know of. Okay. And are there any Koreans left here? I don't see any. I walk the streets of Watts. I, I walk the streets. I walk from Nixon Gardens to Jordan Downs to Imperial Courts. I walk and I walk and I have never seen many Koreans. They may own liquor stores. That's oh, about yeah. that's about it. But they, but I don't see them in the in the community. It's been a big part of the community. One thing I wanted to ask you about, I guess, since you opened it up and brought it to my attention, was the liquor store uh, issue still within Los Angeles. Um, I believe that we had a decree of less liquor stores in South yes, LA. Yes, we did. And do you see that being honored? I actually, I I, I honestly don't know. I I don't think. Sometimes I don't think. My feeling. It's only feeling they don't care. Liquor stores can abound all the rest. There's a liquor store on 160 Wilmington Avenue has been the cause of it, has been the place of many crimes, and nobody's done anything about it. So I get the feeling, honestly, in, in South Los Angeles, that they don't care about liquor stores. I think they close their eyes to it. I, I'm, that's the way I feel. I mean, the liquor stores are not disappearing; they're they're appearing. A liquor store lately has been sold down in Avalon, and it's been sold to Koreans. Who probably won't work there. Oh, they won't work there. Oh, they, no, they will not work there. They, don't, they won't live there. Part of that is, um, I've heard a lot of anti-Korean statements in Watts um, from different people I've interviewed um, who will slip it out or say, uh, and I, I think there are still a lot of anti-Korean feeling here. Oh, yes, I think so. But I, I, don't hear, I don't hear a lot of it, but I think deep beneath the surface it is. Yeah. Okay, you had three different terms for how uh, you saw Watts, or, you know, just summing it up very quickly as black, poor, you know, and neglected. That's the way it's seen. Yeah. That's the way it's how would seen. you describe it now? It's Latino, black. I maybe I've lived here so long I don't see it as poor as, as what people think it is. I think there's tremendous leadership in the inner city. Crime has gone down in Watts, because you know that Watts Gang Task Force, crime has gone down. Um, and of course, I love it. I love Watts anyway, so I'm, I'm very positive about Watts, because I see an amazing people. I see an amazing leadership. I see a holy people. I do see the, pro the big problem of Watts is education. But that's all South Los Angeles, is to educate our children. And I do see it. We have to improve our public, public education. <laughs> Our, our school, Catholic school, is going very well because all our kids go to high school, go to Catholic high school and go on to college, all our kids. So I do see Watts, but I don't see it as, as what people would see in the past as black or violent or gang-ridden. I don't see it as that way. The, the projects, or now we call them developments, when I was here, first were all, was all black. Now it's probably more than 50% Latino. That's a huge change. And I see the rise of Latino leadership in my own church. Not just going out to the church, I see it in the Catholic Church, an amazing rise of, of Latino leadership. It's uh, exciting, um, but it's also a lot of rapid change quickly, which characterizes a lot of Los Angeles history, and yes. that always is a cause for unease no matter what. Yeah, because because I think the blacks feel displaced, and I, I agree. If I was Irish, I mean, it's like being Irish, being the minority, all of a sudden another group of people come in. I'm now less and less and less. So I am, am I being displaced? And mm -hmm. I think that's a normal feeling for the black people, to feel I am displaced. And we've made a special effort in the church, I think in the Catholic Church here at least, to make sure that we were making a special effort 
that say we know we you are important to us. You were here long before the Latinos were here, and we recognize you. Like Osi Gonzaga, we recognize you. You are a part. You built this church. Therefore, we're going to reach out to you. Yeah, she told me that the masses should go back to Latin. That way, everybody would go together. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in one way, you know, in one way, she has a, she has a point. But I mean. You want people to understand what you're saying. I do. I mean, I, I could never go back to Latin. I, 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 I can see what you're saying, that we're all going to go as one. But, I mean, there's a cultural, there's a cultural difference. I mean, Latinos are not the same as black, and Irish are not the same as uh, Latinos are black. We're all different. We're very different. Our cultures are different, and that's the way it is. We've got to respect the different cultures. I want to ask you about the... Uh, okay, so you heard a lot about Watts, the Watts riots. Yes. What did you hear? Only when I came here. I didn't even know they existed because when I joined the Franciscans in Ireland, Franci Capuchin Franciscans, we were not allowed to watch TV. We had no radios. That was, I joined in 1964. Therefore, I didn't even know the riots existed. So, Watts didn't exist until I came here. And then when I came here, I saw it and I realized, and I realized that the, basically the big problem, at least for me, and I think it was the black people, was the police and the blacks. It was the way the blacks were treated. And they were right. You know, and when Barack Obama says racial profiling, he was right. He, he didn't want to say it, maybe he shouldn't have said it. But the fact is, I think he believes it. And, and the fact is, it's true. Oh, that was racial profiling. He just spoke prematurely he, about he it. He broke prematurely, but it is true. There is there is that thing about black. Our coach in our school has been pulled over because he drives a nice car. So there is racial profiling, whether we like it or dislike it. And there is, and there is this thing about black. I mean, the whites, the white people have a thing about blacks, not so much about Latinos. They have a thing about blacks. And it is deep beneath the surface, and it'll be a long time before it's healed. You don't think that there's uh, police harassment against um, Latinos in Los Angeles, or you I, don't I'm, see it as much? I'm not. A, I'm not aware of it as much. I, I presume. I think it's there, but I think what I hear when I go to the Watts Gang Task Force, I'm aware of that. The, certainly, blacks are treated. That, although it has improved because of our relationship with the with the police department. The police has been tremendous. That has been a great blessing. The communication, um, and probably Latino. Yes, it probably is. The Latinos will tell you, yes, they'll say it is. I, I don't know, I think it's, it depends on the attitude of the police themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, you know, if you're, if you're a good human being, you won't, you, won't, you won't do it, that's the way I feel. If you're a good you're a policeman, a good priest, good anybody, you won't, you won't. It's just treating people with respect treating, at all times. Treating people with respect, that feels me, but it's, the, it's that image of you're South Los Angeles, therefore you're suspicious or you're undocumented, which is sad. But to me, I don't care if you're undocumented. That's not my life. But this, I pray about every day that I will not treat, mistreat a human being. And if I do, and which I have, I have, I have not been 100% perfect, then I go back and I'll apologize and I'll make another effort. Whether it's sitting out on the sidewalk or whatever, I, and, and the poor people have taught me le many lessons. Poor people are wonderful people. So I have, I have tried to say, no, they are they're, they're saints. Some of them are saints. And I said, oh, well, one day I'll meet them in heaven. Who'll be higher? They might be higher than me, way higher than me. So I tried them. I always treat a poor person as somebody who was born, mother hold, held him in her arms or her in her arms. That was a child. Now whatever happened on the journey, is I'm not the judge. And I see them here every day. I see them sleep in the sidewalks, but I, I don't know why they're there. Um, a poor person in the park, for instance, in, in, uh, in uh, Will, uh, we call it Will Rogers, Ted Watkins Park. Watkins. Park, Ted Watkins Park. Um, put her hand into her sock, pulled out her wallet in, a, in her sock, and gave me $40. So poor people are continually telling me they're somebody. I didn't want to take the $40, but she wanted to give it to me. So there is, there is a thing about poor. Poor is ignorant. Also, there's this image, poor is ignorant. No, poor is not ignorant. Poor hasn't got the opportunity sometimes. That's what the problem is. It's not that they're ignorant. They're not ignorant. Tell me a little bit about the LA riots. What do you recall of them, of 92? Not an awful lot because I wasn't here. Oh, okay. I didn't leave in 92. I was in San Francisco in 92. I heard about them. I was very, uh, Reginald, uh, Reginald Denny, I was very, I was very conscious of him. They'd take a pill, pulling him out of the truck and hitting him with bricks. Um, but any riots, I, I, any riots, 
for me reflects a lot of anger and frustration, uh, pent up anger, uh, and it's, sometimes it's very irrational, whether it be black, white, brown, or whatever it is, and I, I, I understand, I understand how it happens, of the unemployment, the situation, the way that people feel, and it just starts by just one incident. But then people who have all this anger within them, it's um, an opportunity for, for them to express their anger, which is very sad, but that's the way it is. Right. Whether it be in a prison, whether it be in South Los Angeles, whether it be any place. And I'm always sad about b people burning down buildings, unemployment, all the things that come because of riots, but they don't think of that. They're not thinking of that. All they're thinking of is the present. And poor people, they only think of the present. They're not thinking of yesterday. They don't think about the future. They're just frustrated. Life is futile, whatever it is. So I understand the, the futility, futility of it. Well, and they're also not being taught this history as well. So learning different methods of approaching exactly, that, exactly that, that kind of frustration. Right, yeah, for say that, that burning down buildings is not the answer, but that's the way they express it. Right. The only time they actually do hear about it is in music. It seems you know as kind of this homage to. Well, it's not, well at yeah. least at least it's expressed in the music. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh no, there is frustration. I can and I can see it. I can see it in Watts. I can see it in the projects. I can see frustration. I walk through them. I can see young men unemployed. What are they doing all day? You know, they feel helpless, useless. You know, they feel. In fact, they feel they feel embarrassed about themselves. They are actually depressed about their own selves. Mm -hmm. It's not that the other people are just. And they're disappointed in their own selves. And so they, you know, they're where they're going. Somebody said to me one time, Watts is a place where you're born nowhere, living nowhere, and going nowhere. Which is, if that's the way you feel, and that's the way a lot of people feel in Watts, that's the way, and even our children. I try to preach to them that it, you know, there is something special, it's a beautiful, there are beautiful things in Watts, but none of our children want to live in Watts when they grow up, which is something. None of our children, these are Catholic school kids, none of them ever say, I will live here in Watts. The dream is to be out of Watts. Now, whether whether brought up with people talking about it, it's the image on television, whatever it is, but that's the way it is. If we could do something to help Watts, what could we do? I educate the children. I'm I'm leaving Watts, and I and, and yesterday all the services, all the masses. I asked people. I didn't want gifts. I said I don't want any gifts for myself. All I'm asking you is to contribute to the fund for scholarship for children. Whether it be one dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, whatever it is, I'm asking you to contribute. That's the, that's my feeling. The and I, when I came here first, that would not be the way. I'd feel, oh, we'll feed the poor, give them shelter, which is still true. But I think that the, the I, and that I think I know the biggest, most important thing in not just Watts, South Los Angeles, educate our children. And I've said to the people if yesterday at mass, if you're born in Watts, don't make an excuse saying, well, I can't do it. No. If I'm born here, I must do it. I must get an education. Don't don't say you can't do it. I must. And therefore you put up the challenge to the children. And there are people from the children from Nicholson Gardens who have gone to our school today who would not have seen it as a reality uh, say twelve years ago. And now graduated from our school, have graduated and are going to Catholic high schools. Kids from Jordan Downs going to Verbum Day and going on to um, uh, Bishop, uh, not Bishop, uh, uh, Loyola, uh, Marymount. Marymount. Mm. That's that's what I think. Greatest thing I would say is go out and preach for the children. Okay. That these children are not any different on Manhattan Beach, or Palos Verdes, or Pacific Palisades. They're not any different. These are one of our children who got from our school has got a full scholarship all through doctorate going to Brown University. And all those children that that family are all going to university, and their father was a plumber. And a, and a builder, and mother cleans cleans the, the uh, cleans at the airport and cleans houses, and all those kids have gone to university. What's the name of the family? Queer. That's awesome. It's it is an awesome family. I would interview that family in the morning, and an awesome family. It's an awesome family. I've seen how could they? Where did that motivation come from? And these are brilliant. They're brilliant children because we equate it and equate poverty with ignorance. It is not true. What they say in it is a book on a framework for understanding poverty. And it says that the, the poor people see education as a, as a value, but not as a reality. 
But we said to the kids, no, this is not just a value, it's a reality and we'll make it a reality for you. Mm -hmm. We'll help you, you can do it. And, and not only can you can, you must do it. That is the single, and if you go to Jordan's restaurant, he will tell you that his four children are on nails. Who else should we be uh, highlighting in our timeline as leaders and shakers who are really aspirational? In uh -huh. Jordan's restaurant, Oscar, no doubt in my mind. Michael Wainwright, who does the work over here at the uh, Jobs for, for Young People at Jen Son's office. Um, Donnie and Hank, who work in Nickerson Gardens, who work very hard for this. Tony, who works over the seniors, senior, the Rose, they call it the Rose Garden. Anne Marie Woods, amazing woman. Obviously, Ozzy Gonzag. Sweet Alice. I, I, you know, whatever about Sweet Alice. I mean, she's obviously a leader, but she has doesn't seem to have involved herself much in this community. Betty, Betty, did, she has probably, but I don't see her. I don't see her involved with it, what what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Betty Day is definitely a leader in, in her own right in, in, in Jordan Down. Sister Soldier is at, at, uh, at uh, Imperial Courts. I mean, she's lost two children, but she's hung in there. I, I presume, I presume uh, 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 Watkins is, is a leader. I mean, I don't know much about him, Tim Watkins. I, so I, I'm not quite sure what he does as, as a leader in this community. What, what about Janice Hahn? Should I talk to her? Oh, I think Janice is wonderful. I do. I think Janice has a tremendous interest in the community. Janice is an amazing woman. Janice definitely. Eric is there, her, her secretary. Um, Francisco? From yeah, oh, well, Francisco knows the community very well. From and he's done very well. He's done extremely well. He's got a great sense of humor. He's got a, he, I saw him there this morning and I, I thought to myself, and I told him, I said, you've done amazing work. He, when he was in the beginning, he was attacked, he was bullied. So these are the people. No, these are the people who the, the ordinary people who walk the streets uh, who have power. I, I would say definitely George Russell because he's an for me he's an amazing man because he'll tell you the truth. Yeah. Black, brown, whatever it is, he'll tell you the truth. He'll tell you this is the way it is, and he'll tell you the, tr the truth also about the black people. He won't just go in to defend. He'll right. say this is what's wrong, this is what's right, which I which I like. I like to go up to somebody and say, is this true about Irish or is it true about English? Yeah. <laughs> is it is it true? And he will tell you. Yeah. I think one that you should talk to also is Linda, uh, Linda Northup. She works here. She comes from Manhattan Beach. She is an amazing woman. That woman has come here for the last, I'm here nine, I'm here 11, 13, 14, 15 years maybe, has worked, comes up here, spends a lot of time with the children, does an after school mentoring program. She is very aware of this area, has made choices herself to be involved in this area, is very honest with the kids in building leadership. So Linda is very, is a very important person.